elearning.law, where learning the law makes sense. We're back. Uh, this is Troy Doucette, and next we're going to talk about how to draft a motion. So once you know what motion you want to file or what you want to accomplish by a motion, then you've got to get into the nit and gritty of actually drafting it. What is it? You know, how, how does it work? And what do you need to have on paper in order to maximize the chances of you winning the case? Because ultimately, you can write anything you want down on a piece of paper, and you can have a stream of consciousness that lasts four hours long, and that comprises 35 pages of material. But that's probably not going to be a very effective motion when you get before the judge. So the question is, is how do we maximize the chances that you're going to win this thing once you've decided that you're actually going to file it? Uh, there are ways that lawyers regularly draft these things. There are ways that we are taught in law school on how to do this. And this part of our motion, uh, this part of our lesson rather, is going to go into a little bit broader picture. And then the next one we've got is all about Iraq. And as that's not the country, it's I-R-A-C. That's how lawyers are taught to actually write individual sections. So let's start off with bigger picture. You've decided to draft a motion. The thing you need to understand or thing that you need to think about first is your objective. What do you want to accomplish? What do you want the court to rule for you? Because ultimately a motion asks the judge to do something in your preferably in your favor. So what do you want to do? And then how are you going to get there? What this what is a civil rule? What does a case law say? What's the underlying rule from the case law? Maybe even the standard of appeal. And then, the, then you'll understand what your framework is that you have to work within. This is a little bit technical. I don't really want to get into all these details right here with you, other than to say that um, so long as your motion follows a general framework that I'm showing to you here, you're going to get it heard. You're going to get some kind of opportunity uh, for the judge to pay attention to it. You might not get a hearing out of it, but the judge will be able to understand what you're getting at, what you want to accomplish, and also um, uh, you know, the, um, the, the end objective. Lawyers that, are, you know, uh, that, that have just come out of law school or lawyers that have been in practice for a little bit of time are going to need a little bit more individual structure and be thinking about these things, especially the standard of review on appeal, because this will help them de decide and you to decide whether or not you're actually going to move forward with the motion. For example, um, uh, if you have a hostile judge and you want to get in some really technical detail on a motion to compel discovery, um, it might simply be not worth it to go forward with a motion to compel because um, because you know, if you don't really need the information or if it just be extra, it's highly technical. You've got a hostile judge that might, is probably going to rule against you anyway. And because the standard of review for granting or denying discovery requests or, or motions to compel on discovery is such so broad, it allows the, court, the trial court, the judge, so much power, you might decide that it's not something that you actually want to go in and do in this case. But if you do, it at least gets you uh, protected from an appellate standpoint. But your overarching objective is the first thing that you want to think about. Once you have your objective, you can consider, is a motion the best mechanism to use for it? In the last lesson, I talked a lot about a notice versus a motion. When might a notice and when might a motion be used? Um, a motion might be best when um, when you have something big and important to do. A notice might be something that is less important that you want to notify. You want to get the information out there, but you don't want to cause World War III over it, and you don't want to give the other side to get you know to have a response. So you might do a, a sir reply or um, you know a, a notification of um, supplemental law that you found or something along those lines that doesn't give the other side a chance to respond. A motion 
gives the other side a chance to respond. So if you're going that direction, if you want to give them that, this is where you should be. Otherwise, take a look at your notice instead. You can think in terms of upsetting the court. Um, you know, you can think in terms of a motion. This is, this is a little bit complex, but this is what we get into a little bit with some of our cases, is do we want to sort of test out and see what the judge thinks about whatever we're doing? I'll give you an example of this. So I had a case once that our clients were the defendants in a foreclosure action. And the case was open about a year, over about a year or so, and we were doing a good job defending it out. In fact, once we got through discovery, we realized that the bank had probably done the bank had miscalculated some of our clients' fees, and some of the things that it added to the loan were improper. And we realized through the discovery process that they were probably doing this to a lot of other people also. And we thought that this was so systemic that it was worthwhile to look at a class action against the servicer, against the plaintiff that had filed this, action, this lawsuit. But we didn't necessarily know what judge or whether the judge that we had right then and there would be open to it or whether we needed to find a different forum for it, you know, if the judge wouldn't allow us to file it. So what we did was we filed a motion for leave to fi- amend our complaint to add in class action allegations. And the reason why we did that in front of this court is because the case had already been going on for a year. It was already complex enough. And we figured that if the judge was going to be open to looking at and considering even more complexity, then our motion for leave would give him a really easy out to pass on it. In other words, a motion for leave to amend to add in a class action is such a big deal. It would create such a big headache and workload for this judge, um, who happened to be a man at that time. Uh, it would be such a big issue for him to, to have to deal with. We wanted to test and see whether he w- there was any interest there, whether he would be open to and interested in pursuing this with us. And lo and behold, he granted our motion. The other side threw up, the other side got national counsel involved. They had a very large memo contra that pointed at all the different ways that it wasn't going to succeed and how, what a big waste of time and how we're already a year into the case. And we're like, you know what, what you know, why not? They did, it's pretty clear. We, we think the allegations are clear. They've done this a bunch of times. Let's do this. And the judge was like, yeah, sure. So in that case, and that surprises us actually, because usually that wouldn't happen, but that allowed us to test the, the, the judge, test the judge's openness to uh, a potential claim. So that's something you can think about. Now, so you've decided to file a motion, what's next? Once you realize you're gonna do a motion and you know what your objective is, This is how I tend to think about it. This is how I think that uh, you should frame this in your mind. So I want you to picture this. It's Thanksgiving. Uncle Bob is over. Everybody has an Uncle Bob. Maybe you graduated fifth grade. It's not knocking fifth grade, but it's just um, he's not, uh, he's never ventured outside his own neighborhood, um, grew, you know, and um, and he's, he's got a lot of opinions. You know, we all have Uncle Bob, you know, that, that just has got a lot, a lot of opinions about whatever it might be and is not really interested in to hear what other people's opinions is. I want you to think about your case and think about Uncle Bob for just a second because he also likes to interrupt people a lot and talk over them. Uncle Bob asks you how your case is going. And at this point in time, you have or you realize you have about three sentences to capture Uncle Bob's interest. If you can't sum up what is going on in three sentences, he's lost. And if you're but but if you're successful in those three sentences, you've got another five sentences to sway Bob to your side. So the question is, is what do you tell Uncle Bob to get him rooting for your client? This is quintessentially your theme. This is your introduction. This is the thing that you're, these are the thoughts that you're going to package down into succinct three sentences, eight sentences, and, and you know, a paragraph and a half. You're going to be selling to the judge. 
because some judges have only about this much time to get into and figure out what is the nature of whatever's in front of them and how they might feel about it. You need to get this Uncle Bob to your side right away. This isn't to say judges are like Uncle Bob, but rather judges just need to hear the bullet points and need to be swayed right away uh, from what our experience in order to get uh, get them moving in your side. But that three sentences is your sales pitch, right? I mean, it, it's the thing that's going to get Uncle Bob thinking. It's simple terms. It's understandable terms. It's, it's down to earth. It's things that are relatable to something in his life that he can he can understand. It doesn't mean you need to know what the court, you know, what the judge does in his spare time, but rather that it's relatable messaging for somebody. You're not getting into detailed case law. You're not describing what this one case you found out of, you know, Oregon or New York or New Hampshire says about A, B, or C. You're boiling your case down, your big theme down into something that is understandable and elevator speech that the judge can quickly understand, or the staff attorney, or whoever's reading whatever you're doing. So section one, when we're drafting motions, is not the law. We do this in our practice. In fact, what we do is in our software, we have a section that says, um, identify, or, you know, state the case's theme. State whatever the introduction is. And we literally type in this section whatever that, that three to five sentence sales pitch is, and then all of our um, uh, templates, our document templates dealing with motions and pleadings, all automatically pull in that content directly into our motion, our pleading, on for every single thing we do for that case. So every single time the, the judge or the staff attorney looks at our case and looks at whatever's going on, anything that we have filed, they are immediately are reminded about this strong sales pitch that sells the, sells the story. It's, again, not about the law you found wherever, wherever. It's about the real life. And I'm going to show you an example here towards the end of this particular presentation. But the this is your introduction. This is your Thanksgiving Day speech that we do as the introduction. So we will literally have in our motions, point number one, We'll have, as you saw last lesson, we'll have the cover page, you know, motion to dismiss. We, you know, defendant hereby states, blah, blah, blah. We're moving to dismiss based on 12B6 period. Sincerely sign me. Next page says memorandum in support of motion. I, title, I, you know, point I, introduction. And then we get into the next two paragraphs is your introduction within this. If you want this introduction to be as effective as possible, you're going to think about your theme. You're going to succinctly state it. This is not four pages. Again, you've got to think about, and the reason why I like this Uncle Bob story is because you, you can't keep his attention if you're going into five pages and 20-minute conversation about what the case is about. His mind is running all over the place in different places. You've got to boil it down, and you've got to give it to him within two paragraphs, the most, what things are about. You can get into all the background and all the detail and all the other crap that you need to, you know, is really important for the judge to understand and hear. Put that all later on. I'm going to show you where to put that here later. The introduction, though, is just to get right to the point and give the judge exactly what they need in order to understand what you, what your case is all about. Okay. So, what's your story? What is your case all about? You know, your theme. This is your big picture. I think this is a different way of saying your Thanksgiving story. This is how another way that I, I talk about it. People say, you know, oh, Jimmy doesn't under, know the forest for the trees. In other words, that Jimmy is looking so much at the individual uh, individual details and what the bar color of the bark it on is on the, you know, white pine located 50 feet from him that he doesn't realize that he's standing in the middle of a forest. So your theme, your introduction is that forest, that thing you need to, uh, to get to right away in order to be as powerful, okay? Once you think about this a little bit more and you think about this big, this big theme concept in Uncle Bob, it's about short and sweet, right? You're not going to the. You're not telling them a 
um, a romance novel or a mystery novel where they've got to wait for seven pages to hear who done it, you know, or what the big point is at page seven. Don't hide the smoking gun. This is not a murder mystery. Get right to the point right away. I see this all the time with with new lawyers. Every so often, I can end up in doing this. And what I think about is I think chronologically, I think about all the things that happened and I put them all on paper. But what I do sometimes is after I've done all that, if I'm not sure what my theme is, I'll write out the whole thing. I'll write out the chronology. I'll write out my argument section. And then I'll look to that page seven or eight and realize and, and look for what I really all boils down to, what my strongest argument is, what I can share with the reader, the judge, that 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 typifies everything that's going on and identifies exactly why he or she should rule in my favor. That's what I mean by get it out there, don't hide it, don't put it on page seven. If you're concerned about how to write introductions, write the rest of the stuff first and then come back and do the introduction. That, that can be helpful. But also, if you think about the introduction first, then you can think of where you're going to be going with your thoughts. But either one of those, this is the idea, okay? Some ju- I just put on here, this is really a training session for some, you know, my lawyers that I teach. Uh, you know, judges might not read further than the introduction, so make it count. I say this a little tongue-in-cheek, but I also think of sometimes it as reality. You will sometimes get, I have seen judges verbatim write what the other side has written without even identifying any of my arguments, let alone telling me how I was wrong with it. I'll give you an example. Very, very early in my in my case, one of my first cases, I want to say one of my first 20, 25 cases or so, I had a client that um, that a default judgment was taken against the client. It was a foreclosure. And I'm a judicial sales state. So the judge ruled against him on default right away. And what I found was some kind of, um, I forget what the, what the issue was right now, something I discovered and that would lead, allow me to move the court to ask the judge to reopen the case is to file a motion for relief from judgment under civil rule 60, 60. I would I found this thing that I would enable to uh, grounds for relief from judgment and I filed this motion that said we should win this motion based on civil rules 60b 4 and 5 I think that uh, well, let's run with that so I said motion rule we should we should get relief from judgment 60b 4 and 5 Opposing counsel then responded saying, no, no, they shouldn't win. There's no reason why they should. Uh, They haven't established all the reasons why they should under Rule 60B 1 and 4. Okay, my motion was under 4 and 5. They they were arguing against 1 and 4. And and I was like, oh, this is going to be easy win. I mean, they didn't even dress um, my my point uh, uh, my point 5. Like if they don't address it, they don't argue against it. I win it because there's no there's no counter to that, right? I got a judge. I got the order from the judge a few weeks later that says my motion was denied because I didn't establish the rule or the reasoning under 60b rules, uh, rule 60b one and four. Okay, didn't even read my material. Just wrote verbatim what they did. The problem was that they cited the wrong sections, right? They cited the the wrong areas of the law. So I went and I filed a a motion for reconsideration. I said, look, judge, uh, I did this under four and five. They addressed one and four. Um, So, you know, I I went under five. Worst case is, please address my point five so I can take an appeal on this. So you know what the judge does is he, he fixes the order the new order that comes out says that I have lost based on rule 60B, get, you ready for it? 60B 1 and 5. Okay, so my motion again was under 4 and 5. Judge went from 1 and 4 to 1 and 5 and didn't give me my 4 and 5. So I had to I had to call the staff attorney up. I'm like, we filed this under 4 and 5. Can you please correct your order so I have a final appealable order so I can take an appeal, you know, we can appeal you. 
that is that is my that has been my experience and that is a, an indic that is a true life story indicative of what we have found judges need a, a really good capturing introductory statement to pull them in so if they don't read anything else they know you've given them a reason to keep reading a little bit further i didn't i didn't realize that i think at the time i, I went too much into the law too quickly like you do sort of you learn in law school without developing the strong the strong theme but that's section one so after your two paragraphs that should not be any longer than a half a page long i mean longest if you really have to one page but really a page, and I'll show you an example how to how to do a good theme. I think in one of our lessons or one of the bonuses, or, or, or if, depending on how you purchase this this uh, uh, session, but or this this uh, course, but developing a theme, I get into a little bit more of that. The the after you get into the introduction, then you get into the background. So your background is their narrative that you get to get into all the relevant facts, the relevant facts plus the facts that sell your story, right? Uh, you got the relevant facts that go to the law, but then you also get, um, you, you, um, um, you know, the, the little, a little sizzle, if you can add it in there, just don't add in things that are absolutely not relevant and don't add anything to your story. Uh, for example, um, the fact that, uh, you made a phone call to the servicer on, uh, May 8th, uh, 2014, and your case has nothing to do with phone calls or May of two or or 2014. Like, why did you just add that in there? Is irrelevant fact. Don't add that in there. Um, but if, on the other hand, you can um, add in, you know, if if your story is about how they really uh, uh, pulled the rug out from underneath the homeowner, um, then maybe those phone calls and and what was said on those phone calls becomes a little bit more relevant. But the background is a little bit more novelesque, right? You're you're going through um, the the facts that and the concepts that are important, logical, and that uh, get right to the point. Okay. The real boring stuff, um, the real legally stuff, we're going to roll forward into the argument a little bit later. But your background is is a story. And I've got some examples here. I have a really cool slide coming up that I love to share with you. Here's um, Here's a story, I don't know where I pulled this offline, but I like the picture, I like the visual. You've got your introduction as your green here, you've got your yellow as sort of your background, and then you get a little bit of the argument, and then you get your conclusion at the end. But your, your you know, to a background point, you're starting at the beginning of time, you're moving forward in a chronological order, you're not attacking the other side's character. It drives me nuts when uh, lawyers do that. Uh, John is not a low life. John's not a piece of crap. Um, John stole with no regard for repercussions. Or the bank is uh, not a uh, do nothing, worthless, you know, bank. But rather, it's a bank that's been cited uh, 15 times by you know 10 different attorney generals and has four different consent judgment orders against them because of the exact same thing that they did in our case, right? You're implying with the bank that the bank is a really terrible institution without saying, you know, they are a crappy institution. You're keeping it the fact bases that that go to establish whatever emotional trigger that you're looking to to do. Sometimes attorneys on the other side will attack my client. Sometimes they'll attack me individually, which is always um, always an interesting uh, story or interesting thing to, to, to see. And, but, and as a side note, I'll tell you why that's interesting and why it's almost a good thing sometimes when the other side is attacking your client's character, your client personally, or you, quite frankly, or the lawyer's character personally. And the reason why it's sometimes a good thing is because it really reflects that you're winning the case or the other side thinks that you're winning the case. Here's an analogy for that for you. If you, if you like sports and you've got a sports game going on and you're rooting for your side and the other side is losing, do you have any desire whatsoever to walk up to the opposing side's coach and punch them in the face. No. 
Your side is winning. You're on cloud nine. You're feeling great. There is no reason for you to walk across the field and punch the other side's coach in the face. Like you're not mad in the slightest bit against that opposing counsel or that opposing party's coach, right? The same thing applies in litigation. If the other side is attacking the players or attacking the, it's because not because they feel like they're winning and they're awesome and they're on cloud nine, it's because they're losing and they feel like they're losing miserably. Doesn't mean you don't address their negative stuff or you call them out. You want to call them out on their negative things. You want to talk about how unprofessional and uh, it, that their comments are, whatever they said, how um, uncouth and irrelevant and uh, uh, obnoxious and what a red herring and uh, use all the, the, the objectionable words that you can use to really call them out on whatever their, their thing is that they're, they're calling about you. You can almost make part of your motion about their conduct um, and because if their conduct is really egregious. But from my point, when I get involved with litigation, when somebody starts attacking me, I don't take it personally. I don't think it isn't as negative. I think of it as a positive means that I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm winning something because of that, that story. So don't, don't take stuff personally. But when you're dealing with background, you're dealing with you know, a, a forward basis. Okay. Your background also is your story. So we'll get into the argument. We get into the law in, uh, in just a moment. But your background is is where is chronology. But also you're you're answering, you're satiating the reader's curiosity: the who, what, when, where, how, why. You know what are the if you read your story, have somebody else read your story. Have a spouse or your neighbor or your family member read your read your background story, and ask them. What else do you want to know? What else do you do you want to hear? If the response for them is it's really long, then that tells you you should probably shorten it. Okay, listen to whoever you're asking for advice. Find a way to take out twenty uh, percent of whatever you said if they think it's really long. But also ask them what are the holes. You know what? What else does the you know what else do you need to answer? If there's a good excuse why our client didn't pay their loan or what caused the default, you know, make sure you you answer that. Get to the the meat and potatoes of what you want to say and the questions that excuse me the judge might have, the other side might have, or might be able to exploit from what you said. Okay. When you're writing this all out, I have seen all kinds of things from pro se litigants. You know, they might want to, you might want to write everything in a, again, stream of consciousness, one sentence to the next. You might want to write this as a, a long text like you would on a text. Don't do any of that stuff, right? Get get back to the basics of, you know, eighth grade elementary, or eighth grade English class where the teacher wants you to write with a introduction sentence, uh, uh, um a um, body sentence and then a conclusion sentence after that, right? This is basic English. Follow this path when you write these things. Do a little indent. Uh, the shorter the paragraphs can be, the better. This is a decent length for one paragraph that you goes into your um, goes into your work. Don't write, you know, include per, uh, periods. Write in capital letters. Use commas as appropriate. I'm going to show you a, a word uh, has a, a check mechanism already built in, but this is how you actually want to write. You want to have a, a conclusion or a transition sentence. And at the end of each paragraph, as you get in the next paragraph, but each paragraphs are written like this. It's a lot better than just one long page of a bunch of words on it. Now, this is the cool slide that I found, this cool information that I wanted to share with you that I love. It's so interesting. The New Yorker magazine, if you know what that magazine is, is written at a fifth grade level. New York Times, sixth grade level. Okay, I, I read the New York Times. It's a long, they write a lot. I mean, those articles are long, but sixth grade level is average. The Economist average um, reading level is eighth grade. So here it is, readability score, scores. Here's New Yorker and New York Times Economist. The Economist is, you know, is a magazine that is um, it's, it's highly. Uh, it's not highly, it's technical with stories involved, right? There's stories that are broken down into concepts that are page long usually that explain something out in, in such a way that's plain English. But the point here is that it's an eighth grade level. 
These, this thing is not college level reading or, or graduate level reading. Sometimes that people feel like they've got to be really fancy with the words that they use or get into a lot of, you know, uh, big words or they'll use, you know, thesauruses to find the biggest word they can find for whatever they want to use. And that's not the way people read. Even, you know, highly educated folks that are reading The Economist, the material they read is on an eighth grade level. It's not 12th grade or 16th grade, right? This readability is based on words per sentence and syllables per word. The lower the number, the better. Lawyers are being taught, when I went to law school, when I graduated in 2010, 2007 to 2010, I was there. You know, our reading, writing uh, professor did not want big words. We weren't to use Latin words. We were to keep things simple and, and understandable in plain English. There is a real shift in the law profession towards plain vanilla, simply understood words, and you should follow that. You should not try to compensate for a feeling of inadequacy or feeling that you don't have the legal training that everybody else does or the other side's at a bigger law firm or they're smarter or they're better or they've got more experience or whatever it is, so you need to add in a bunch of big words. Don't fall into that trap. Just think of it, think of what you're doing as does this you know, make sense. Is it short? Is it easy to understand? And that sentences are no longer than a line or two at the most. And your paragraphs are also short. You have an opening, a body, and a transition into the next one. That's how you're going to have a real strong uh, product that you produce. To that end, here is what everybody is. If you don't believe me, here's your U.S. National Adult Literally Literacy Survey. Look at this. First or second grade reading level, 21% of Americans. 27% plus 21% is 48%. Nearly half of Americans read at a 3 to 5th grade level. You add on 32% of that, what do we have? 81% of Americans read at a ninth grade level or below. Only 17% can read at a 10th grade or above, and only 3% our 16th. 16th is college graduate. This is law lawyers. Lawyers have, what, what do we have, 20 years of education, right? But only 3% of Americans read at that level. So when you're writing this, it is critical that you are uh, uh, writing your content for the people over here because your judges are going to be over here. Also, I'm not saying they're going to be over here. I'm just saying as a percentage of Americans are concerned, you're going to have some judges that read between, uh, you know, a sixth and ninth grade level. So why give them something that is more complicated, that's going to take more time and more energy to read? Plus, when you use easy to read words that are smaller, it flows faster. It looks better. It's easier on the eyes. You can organize things logically. Here's all these things I have. It does not require a second or third reading. How many of you, when you read something complicated, have to go back and read the same sentence over and over again so it can, so it can sink in? You don't want somebody reading your material, your, your motion, to have that kind of problem. You want them to easily flow from one section to the other, from one sentence, one word from another. Using smaller words are going to help you do that, okay? Now, if you want to test it, you have tools out there. I actually use a, a program. Uh, it is downloadable. I forget the name of it right now, and I don't want to go to my desktop to tell you. Um, it's a really neat program. You can go, you know, search online for readability software, and they can test it out. It's only like it's only like ten or fifteen dollars, and you get a lifetime, you know, access to it. It's actually software you download that does all this checking. But if you don't want to go that route, and you don't want to go into too depth of something. You can use Microsoft if you use a Windows thing. I'm sure when Apple's has something very similar. When you're correcting grammar in Word, you can select show readability. Oops, show readability statistics checkbox and at the end after you're all done it'll give you the readability scale the higher the score the more readable it is and this gives you an easy way what it also makes sure is that your grammar is correct and your spelling is correct check it check your grammar make sure your commas are where they need to be your periods are that you're using the correct you know um, uh, punctuation throughout the document this is this is going to be important for your background because again you want the want simpler is better you want the everybody to be able to hear it 
How would you explain a 10-year-old? Think about the background details. Stop assuming the reader understands or even remembers your case. You know, a judge might have a thousand different cases. Federal court judges might have three or four hundred cases or two to four hundred cases. They're not going to remember necessarily every single one that is before them. State court judges that have a lot of foreclosures that are filed, one's going to run through to the next. So keep keep that introduction consistent, but also keep that background where it's easy to understand and, and they can follow through easily. Section three, law and argument is your next major section that you're going to be following, that you're gonna have in your motion. Um, this is where you get into all those cases that you really are dying to include within this motion, the things that you're just, you wanna get off your chest, you wanna make sure the judge sees, this is where it's gonna go. This is where you're gonna persuasively, not only technically argue what other law is, but also sell the judge that, or sell the staff attorney, whoever's reading it, that they uh, that you whatever you're bringing up is legally relevant to your story and why you should be winning. Okay, the fir very first section is generally the legal standard. We all include this. I mean, I, I'm you know I I've, I still include summary judgment standards, even though everybody you know that's been litigating um, you know past a few months knows what those standards are. Judges certainly who have been on the bench for a while all know what the su summary judgment standard is. And, um, and, um, and it's almost superfluous, it's almost unnecessary, but it's expected. So you should have it in there. So standard of legal analysis to be used is, for example, your summary judgment. We talked about rule 56, genuine issue of material fact and that you're entitled to judgment as a matter of law. That's right there in Rule 56. That's what you have to show. That's what you need to prove. What you also have to prove in 56, within 56A and 56C, is that you have to attach evidentiary quality material to the motion in order to win it. That's why it's important for you to know what this standard is. You, you, um, if you've been doing it a while and you know what it is, fine, but it's always helpful to include it in there anyway. So everybody is reminded, including yourself, it acts as a reminder what you need to prove, what you need to establish as part of the motion in order to win under the particular type of motion that you're bringing. So if you have a motion for summary judgment, MSJ, again, you're going to have that first little section being you know, standard to win, prevail in a motion for summary judgment is that there's uh, no genuine issues of material fact and that the party is uh, entitled to judgment as a matter of law. And then if you are defending against summary judgment, you might find some case law that says, and the court should be really careful about uh, granting this and should be very cautious and you know the the default is not to grant them easily and how we don't want to resolve cases on the technicalities we want to make sure we're getting into them the substance so their motions for summary judgment should be denied and if you're writing a summary judgment you're gonna be you're gonna say you know this is so easy I, I just got to throw this up there and so long as I don't have anything to rebut it that's halfway decent voila I win my case but when you have it, then you know how to argue it, right? GTE test is something in Ohio where I was talking about 60B in the previous lesson, but it's going to be similar wherever you are. GT test, GT automatic test in Ohio is that in order to get a relief from judgment under Civil Rule 60B, you've got to show one of the reasons you also have to uh, allege a claim or defense, and that that motion has to be done in a re within a reasonable time. Those three things are going to be pretty much standard wherever you are filing a 60B motion. But if you know what those three things are, then you can make sure you actually address them in your argument, right? I mean, if you don't know that you have got to show that the 60B is brought within a reasonable time, if you leave that out, you haven't established that you should win. Everything else that you have written in this document is irrelevant because you didn't address that final piece of 60B. And that's why it's important that you know whatever standard you're in. Once you have that standard, once you have that first paragraph, then you can get into why your situation matches perfectly with whatever the standard is, okay? Once you've got that standard, Next is your first issue that you want to identify, right? Your strongest always go first. If you're filing a motion for summary judgment and you've got three claims, 
and claim number three turns out is your best, start with claim number three. Okay, don't, don't do a numer numeric order. Similarly, if you're litigating out uh, point number three and you've got to show four things in order to win, let's say it's a breach of contract, you've got to show a contract exists, that, that, you're, that the other side's in default, there's damages. Um, let's say those three elements, although there can be more than that, but let's go with those three right now. That a contract exists, that there's a default by the other side, and there's damages. If there's no dispute that um, if uh, that there's a contract existing, and that's a slam dunk, easy to get out of the way, put that first. There's no dispute that there's a contract. If there is little dispute about the amount of damages, put that as number two. If the third thing is okay, the d real dispute is whether there's a, a breach, whether there's you know then then you can go into that as your third thing. But you're putting your strongest count first and the strongest pieces within the count first within that count, okay? If you're responding to their motion and you're doing a memo contra, you are going to rearrange the order that they have so that your strongest is first, okay? Uh, this is a little trick and you're allowed to do this and, and new lawyers sometimes don't know that, but if they're, you know, count five they're trying to win on is total baloney and total ridiculousness, you start with that five in your first argument because what you're going to want to do is show how absolutely wrong it is, how nutty it is, or how, uh, you know, not even close to conforming to any of the evidence or facts, and there, ergo, they, I can't even believe that they're trying to argue this. And then you go into your second strongest, their second weakest, your third, you know, up to their strongest. Because what happens is, is that if you can sway, if you have a powerful enough agree, uh, uh, argument to sway the court, you get the court sort of rolling in the direction of thinking they don't know what they're talking about, right? If, if they got these claims out there that are just nonsense or that don't make any sense, you start with those things because they're utter nonsense. And if you can get the judge thinking, okay, this is nonsense, this thing's nonsense, well, argument three, that might have gone either way, they're on a roll, right? The judge is on a roll, okay, maybe this is also not, or at least mentally thinking, maybe this is nonsense also, or maybe when they get to that final piece, it might even be the strongest of theirs, you've already sort of destroyed their other arguments to where the judge steps back and says, okay, I think we need a trial on this, or I don't think that they should win on this particular uh, motion. But that's how you're actually sequencing this, the, these arguments as you are doing, okay? And as I said, maybe identifying the first count in the complaint, or you, you know, might be the last one, whatever it might be. Whatever it is when you get into it and you begin arguing about it, you're going you're gonna to address the, the law, but you're also going to frame this, this issue in your favor, okay? This is a little bit along the lines of that introduction. You're going to think of, what is my introduction for my first big argument. You know, I've got a summary judgment. I'm arguing about whether or not my payments were correctly made. What is, how do I want to frame that? You know, do I want to get into page three before I say I made all my payments? No, you want to begin saying right away, I'm an innocent person here. I made all these payments. I've got all the proof for you here, judge attached, along with my affidavit saying that I made all these payments, um, and allow me, you know, and, and don't, um, and they messed up, and they are the ones that um, misallocated them. What's even worse is that I called them, I notified them of this error, and they didn't fix it. Even worse on top of that, not only did they not fix it, but they actually filed foreclosure. And by the way, I called them 12 times about this, and every single time somebody told me that everything was going to be okay, and yet they still filed foreclosure. And by the way, attached additionally to this affidavit and my motion is the recordings that I got from them in discovery that shows that you can clearly hear their representative saying, I don't have anything to worry about. That is, that, what, I, what am I really talking about, right? I haven't talked about, is there a contract?
I haven't talked really about what the bank's damages are. What I've talked about is the breach. I have framed the initial argument here that we're making in terms of something that is most powerful for me and my client that sells that individual argument by framing it properly. If you need to think about things or don't know how to do that, start with these words. The real issue here is whatever. You know, put it down there. Here's another issue. So opposing counsel has framed the issue of default. Plain fact is that the defendant is a default and is just trying to buy more time. I'm going to tell you that can be a powerful uh, framing thing that, that a bank's lawyer can do, you know, and that can hit on some chimes that some judges feel as well. I had one judge once in Chambers you know, question why I was defending the case the way that I was, you know, after asking me if my client was in default or not, or paid their mortgage or not. And I think the judge even said something along those, those lines that I, I was taken back until the judge turned to the other side and gave the other side some equal, you know, attack, you know, equal, equal pressure. But this is something you don't need as their framing. You don't need to be there. So you need to counter this. Maybe you've got an FHA conditions preceding defense, and your counter is going to be, you know, your reframing is bank is deflecting from the true issue of this case, which is not the defendant's financial hardship, but rather whether the bank complied with its obligations under federal law before it filed this premature lawsuit. It clearly has not. Right? What a powerful, short, sweet introduction that gets not only the point that you want to make across, but but defangs their framing, right? That's a great example of how you might go about doing that. I have a picture of a horse here. I always say to my, my, my lawyers, you know, you know, that there's a story, and I'm not a horse guy, but I hear that if you walk up to a horse and that, that doesn't want to move and you look them you know, straight in the eyes and you grab a hold of their reins and you start walking, that the horse isn't necessarily isn't going to budge. But if you casually walk up, like you're walking past the horse and you grab a hold of the reins casually and you just start and you continue walking and pull them along, the horse follows you, right? That you can bring a, water, a horse to water, you can't make him drink is another way of looking at it. But the concept here is that by framing things initially, by getting the, the reader to start walking along with you as you're drafting this, that it naturally flows from one argument into your legal basis and the facts that you have and the evidence that you have in order to get the reader, get the judge uh, at the point that is going to be helpful for you. Okay? And essentially, you're going to do this for each one of your uh, ma each one of your arguments. You're going to start with one. You're going to go through that, and then you're going to go through the second, and then the third, however it might be, to get to the 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 end, and continue until all issues are addressed. You do want to cover all the angles. Um, you know, this what this is um, addressing is if they are making some. If you need to address all their arguments. You don't start with theirs, you start with your strongest, and you lay it all out. But after you're done addressing all of yours, if they make something, even if it's ridiculous, you do actually want to address it. You want to attack it in a professional way, but you want to make sure that everything's addressed. Because judges sometimes will look to um, you know, one side or the other. They, their job is to figure out who should win. And if you don't address one of their, the other side's arguments, the judge could look at that as a, you know, that you gave up on it, that you acquiesce, that you agreed that that point wasn't in contention, that the other side should uh, win on that point because you didn't bother addressing it. We've had that happen in motions, even things that were, you know, weren't really relevant anymore. And we, you know, we've had a lot of, a, you know, taken appeals on that kind of thing that, that don't make any sense, you know, that don't end up making any sense. But that's the risk that you have to you have to encounter that you are going to want to make sure you cover what you can everything you can and defend all your points before i get into conclusion let me say this also about attacking their points and defending all yours um there is a, i think i'm going to include a lesson at some point on uh, Sung Tzu's Art of War. You know, I, I analogize that a few years ago. I rewrote the book to, to effectively follow litigation. Sung Tzu's, I, my, my copy is um, uh, The Art of War for Lawyers. But one of the neat things that Sung Tzu talks about in warfare, and it's very analogous to, to litigation, which is essentially warfare on paper, but is that if you are up against an army 
and they um, and your your defenses seem strong. Um, they are going to need to pick a point of attack, and that point of attack is usually going to have to be a spear. It's going to have to be direct. And in litigation, you'll find the same things. If you have five or seven different counts, I had this once in a case, or I did this on purpose, where we had five or seven different counts, really one of them, one of the sixth or seventh, was actually the one that I thought was really important that I wanted to win on, that I wanted to pursue. But I included six or seven because when they went to attack my case, they would have to spend an equal amount of energy on every single one of my points. And people don't tend to do that. What happens is, is they pick the one that they like the most or that they want to pursue, and they put all their energy into it. So opposing counsel, that's what he did. He put all of his energy and pages of argument onto you know, point number two, count number two or, or uh, three that I had. And then by the time he got to the one that I really cared about, count six, um, it, was, it was a half a page long. And that was really what was important to me. So then I got to counter with my emotion, and I, I was able to just absolutely obliterate them, or uh, uh, my memo contra, and then ultimately my emotion, obliterate them on that particular issue because that was really what I always wanted to do. So if you can get opposing counsel to not know what your strategy is and have to attack you on all your points, then you um, you can you can lead them t- into into uh, into losing essentially. But at the same time, you know, when you go to attack theirs, if you if you can focus, you know, all of your if you have a stronger stronger uh, path, you are going to have a stronger army. You're going to have to attack every single one of theirs, right? You're not going to want to do the same thing that they did. You want to instead equally attack or equally address each one of their points. You have got to attack all of their points while you are defending your own. And if you can do that successfully and they're not able to, well, then you've got a, a much better shot at, at prevailing on what you want to prevail. After you get all through that, after you get through argument, the last thing is the conclusion. This is your title, your section uh, four that you're going to include, and it just summarizes everything. It's not complicated, except that you want to actually ask the court for what you want. If you don't ask for it, the court can't give it to you. So whatever you say, you know, I, you know, I hereby request the court dismiss this, or I hereby request judgment in uh, my favor on all counts of the complaint, and you know, damages at, at tr- you know, whatever damages a jury awards or damages of X, Y, and, and Z. You want to do that. If you don't address all of the elements within the counts, when, or all of the the counts or all the elements within the summary judgment, if you're the only one who seeks to move summary judgment, you could end up with trial on one individual count or one claim or one element of one claim that, and you didn't mean to do that because you just forgot to address it within your summary judgment. So do make sure that when you go to your conclusion, it's, it's comprehensive and that you've actually covered everything. Final other considerations, things I want you to be aware of, things that you should know. State versus federal systems, I've used Ohio. Florida is even different than this, but this is, uh, other, your state might be differently. New York is different, um, but this is generally how court systems work. You've got your Supreme Court at the top, U.S. Supreme Court, federal court system, U.S. or Ohio. This should be Ohio Supreme. No, this is actually Supreme Court of the United States is the, the highest. Underneath them, then you've got Ohio Supreme Court. You can you can um, appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court in, in certain instances if your state court rules against you. But state court system, you've got usually it's a highest court in New York in New York State. The Supreme Court is actually the lowest. But here, in most states, you're going to have the Supreme Court of New Hampshire, Supreme Court of you know Florida, Supreme Court of Ohio. That's the highest. You're going to have then almost always, I don't know, of any state that does not have an intermediary court of appeals. They might be called the District Court of Appeals as in, uh, as in Ohio, DCA uh, in Florida as well. Um, in the federal court system, they are called circuits. 
So sometimes brand new lawyers, um, when I'm talking to them on the phone, if uh, you know opposing counsel might mix up district with circuit, that mean that usually tells me they don't do a lot of appellate work. This is why you have this slide is because if you want to be real knowledgeable when you're talking to opposing counsel, the minor things, this is one of those little things. You, what is your court of appeals call? What district are you in? This is Columbus, Ohio is in the Franklin County, which is the 10th district. Ohio is in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Michigan, Ohio, Texas, or, um, Kentucky, and Tennessee are all part of the Sixth. You're, you want to figure out what yours is. And then finally, you have the district courts or the trial court level. The federal court has a bankruptcy and magistrates. In a state court, you might have common pleas. This might be called circuit courts in Florida. This could be court of claims, which is claims against the government, municipal, small claims, um, other kinds of things. I'm, I'm forgetting a couple here that are the lowest level, but you effectively have three levels, trial level, appellate level, and then supreme level. Pa uh, district level, trial level, appellate level, and then supreme level. That's what it is. That's why I include it. To get really good at this or to really want to be real fancy with things, you can know what your appeal standards are. Um, I expect my lawyers to know what the appellate standards are. What's the, you know, what is, if I have to take an issue up to the Court of Appeals, what is the uh, appellate standard for it? Is it abuse of disc discretion, which is discovery, which is very easy for the courts, you know, to, uh, uh, to uh, defer to the trial courts. Basically, like abuse of discretion is uh, the trial court gets to pretty much do whatever they want so long as it's not plain error or, or super egregious. Discovery-related things, should you get discovery, should you not, that's usually abuse of discretion. Very, um, very malleable. So we don't usually look at appellate level cases based on discovery issues because of this very thing. Even if I were to take it up, it's going to be hard to win. So, you know, I work with what I have. De novo is brand new all over again. Summary judgment, you know, they don't look at what the court decided. They're going to put set aside the court's order. They're going to look at your brief, the other side's briefing, the memos, memo contras, and they're going to make a decision from scratch as if they were right there. And that's de novo, that's summary judgment. Plain error is the judge completely got it wrong, that there's no, um, even if you didn't even bring it up, and, but you bring it up on appeal, it was so agreed, so plain that it, it gets um, you know, necessary to appeal. But those are your appellate standards. If you, if you want to get into that, you can do a little bit of research for it, but that's, that's uh, not necessary for the vast majority of people defending uh, foreclosure. The other thing you want to think about, what can be really helpful when you're defending a motion or when you're filing one yourself, especially with banks, you're going to attack whatever you can. And if the issue is payments and how they allocated payments, that's a great attack, right? That doesn't happen too often, but that's a great attack. If it's past the statute of limitations, that's a great attack, right? If they didn't comply with the conditions preceding under FHA guidelines, that's a great attack. Use those attacks. But while you're doing that, while you're attacking them, you should also be attacking the technical failures of whatever they've done. And what I mean by that is the evidence they have attached. Is their witness competent to testify about whatever it is? Is, is the affidavit attached, an actual affidavit that's even typed up by the person or even reviewed by the person? Is their name even written into it or is there some stamp that appears that it has their name on it, right? Is the affidavit complete? Does it talk about all those things that need to be discussed to meet the evidentiary guidelines, which I've included a lesson on evidence here as well. Watch that evidentiary lesson if you want to know about how you attack this kind of thing for hearsay and other kind. But this is something you always want to attack, if at all possible, within whatever they're doing, is the actual technical sufficiency of the evidence itself. You might attack it in your memo contra, or maybe you even file a motion to strike. Um, if you get the, the you know an affidavit earlier in the process, you might even want to ask the judge. You know, might even want to send a subpoena to them and go have them testify. Or if you're at summary judgment, you want to ask the judge to delay you having to respond to their summary judgment, so you can go and actually talk to whoever is you know that that actually did this affidavit. Even if they're outside your state, uh, you can do that through the uniform. Um, the for, uh, Uniform Foreign Depositions Act that states have, have gone, have uh, uh, followed. But this is something you also want to do. 
Also, be care, beware of laziness. Okay, right? Uh, overextension. You got, you got, you got. Um, this is something you'd be aware of. You're not going to have this issue too much, but you'll find that sometimes banks, lawyers suffer from this, especially if it's a foreclosure mill that's filed the foreclosure that they're, you know, they do, they have 150 different foreclosure cases. They got to go through all of them. They can't possibly do every single one of them. So they get a little lazy, right? They're overextended and they're not going to be uh, overly cautious or overly analytical about your individual issue, especially if you're pro se, um, that they're going to, there might be issues there. If you can recognize this, then you can press it to your advantage, right? You can strike um, because you're going to be better prepared. You're going to have more evidence that they do, or you're going to have better better arguments or better legal positions because they're not uh, prepared. Additionally, if you do have the time and they are really lazy or slow, um, you want to make sure that you're following up with all of your discovery demands. You want to make their life difficult. You want to create a lot more work for them. You want to take up a vast amount of time. You are going to want to make sure that your crossing T is not in your eyes, and the other side realizes that it's going to be cheaper just to settle this out with you than it will be to continue to you know throw resources at it. And if that lawyer has to do a bunch of work that you know maybe they're getting a flat fee for all this stuff and they don't want to do all of it, that that you get some deals done because you're really pressing. I always aggressively um, you know pursue cases as as appropriate because it gets better results in the end, okay? And then this is your limited motions. I brought this up earlier. I brought this up in the um, uh, the 15 motion types that you have. But basically, you don't have to move to win the whole case. Sometimes you might just uh, seek for uh, judgment on liability on a motion for summary judgment and not actually on damages. You say, I want to go to trial on damages. Again, what that does for you is that delays out um, the um, the time that they can appeal because if you have to go through trial, they can't appeal yet. So they've got to wait all that time. Plus, if you rep- you know if your counsel, you get your attorney's fees for preparing all of it. Now you know you've won if you won liability. So you get to prepare really well and spend the time you need to to properly prepare for a trial. And bill those hours. The other side's going to know they got to pay your hours. And finally, it creates the leverage because. Um, the other side, excuse me, recognizes that they've got all this risk. They've already lost on liability. They've got your fees coming up. They don't want to know what a jury is going to award you. A jury doesn't have any choice but to award you at least something. Uh, they don't want to figure that out. So you get some uh, settlement uh, figures that are big and bigger than you uh, had before. So that is that is drafting a motion. I hope you understand that this is sort of your universe. This is a little technical, but this is how you win a case, right? This is the actual documents, the written words that you're going to use in order to sway the fact finder, the judge to rule in your favor. This is your case. This is why this is important. You've got discovery, which takes up a lot of your time, but you've got this motions and how you draft the motion is the the real thrust of, of where you're going with things. So best of luck to you as you get into some motion practice. I know you might have to watch this video a couple times to absorb all of it. Uh, I'm going to have some additional um, uh, templates for you maybe to to help you out on, on a couple of these things. Best of luck to you moving forward. We'll see you in the next lesson.